Welcome, my friends, to Forgotten Realms, a world that's filled with so much power and evil that trying to pick it out is like trying to cure cancer by eating a bottle of gummy bear vitamins and having a cup in session, where the heroes are powerful, the villains omnipotent, and the game world's power creeps so high, eating a steak requires a friggin' toughness roll. This is the land of Icewind Dale, baby, and of course, the always maligned and always mispronounced Drizzt main character, where even the author can't figure out exactly how he wants him pronounced, and his warrior best friends. These are men and women that you get to be in Dark Alliance, which is coming out for the PC, PS4, and Xbox this week. Dungeon and Dragons Dark Alliance is a big gauntlet, a bit role-playing game, and a whole lot of statistics all shoved into one. And speaking of one, you can play it from one person all the way up to four people, co-op, online, if you choose to. Let's see how it did. As always, if you like the video, well, maybe subscribe. Graphics are up first. Let me paint a little impression for you. One moment, you're exploring a game world, and the next a character literally somersaults into the battle proper, drops an explosive arrow, then also drops a healing laser because, yeah, you know, lasers also heal, then cartwheels out while someone somewhere in the distance summons a giant battle cat to help him fight a dwarf with hands encased in mystic power who's ruin his way Street Fighter style across the level, teleporting with each uppercut as he kills everybody in the party. And that's the low-level stuff. Dark Alliance aims to introduce new gamers to the over-the-top power in Forgotten Realms and some of the important locations, as well as give long-term fans some up-close and personal looks at some of the locations, the enemies, and more importantly, the heroes and allies from the original classic books. And while that might not be everybody's idea of D&D, it has always been Forgotten Realms, which has always been over-the-top magic encased. And when Dark Alliance is doing that perfectly, it's, it is a complete blast. And graphically speaking, it does hit on those cylinders for the most part. There's an enticing mystery and a messy puzzle-like feeling to just about everything that you do within the game world. For example, the God Goblins locations. They have walls made of spears. You know a place is scary if their walls look like they're made of friggin' weapons. Unfortunately. And this is where Dark Alliance hits and misses a little bit. I admit that while I like the characters' general moves and animations, they didn't really actually look all that special. Well, all that special at all, even when throwing out their power moves. And it's never going to get old watching enemies fall at the business end of a barbarian's flying knee strike with all the velocity of a 280-pound man made of pure I-won't-fucking-die particles. I've seen planets move with less intention than that, and I like those animations. When you finally do get some good armor and the moves overall, I would say they start to equal what you expect. But for a lot of people, especially when you first start, it can feel a little bit like watching a TV version of a movie fantasy flick you expected, especially with Drizzt himself. Now, texture-wise and technically, the game is fine if basic using the set pieces and the tools it has more for setting up the next fight than sort of setting up the next incredible looking location. And as you continue to battle, you definitely see a lack of organicness in the levels themselves, whether it's a ladder in a perfect spot or a wood wall in front of a treasure chest, like someone's just running around boarding everything up because they want to hide them. The world has a utilitarian look that's only elevated during those exceptional cutscenes, and there's a bit of a tit for tat there, almost like they're parts of a different game. But how does all this run regardless? So the game has a number of settings, not any great amount, but better than a lot of the games that we've got recently. Surprisingly, it actually performed incredibly well with 4K well above 60 FPS on the 2080 Ti and the i7 at 4.8, something a lot of games have not been able to do. If you have a slower card like a 1080 Ti, I was seeing above 60 easily at 1080p and 1440p in some instances. The game does not have DLSS or render scale. I would have liked to have seen those Sadly, they're not included. And their inclusion is missed here, especially because the game normally runs fine, but about once every other level, there'd be some particular part of it dropping huge numbers of frames, then going back to normal. So you get this smooth experience for, say, an hour, then weird FPS drops, most likely due to some environmental effect that either is too much for the system to draw or missing completely. And that's something I haven't seen in a long time. You'll just be traipsing through the great fantasy fantastic, introducing Mr. Thickstick to some goblin prick, and ending entire family lines of evil creatures, and then suddenly, ran Randomly, you light on fire. It happens a good number of places, and usually you can see the rocks or the items that should be emitting the special effect, but a lot of them just aren't, and sadly, a lot of them you'll see after you've already lit on fire. Unfortunately for Dark Alliance, there are a number of things here that really just do make the entire game feel unpolished. It runs really well, but it's utilitarian style. The fact that the characters themselves just don't really have an it factor, despite their actual counterparts having that, and really regardless of what you do, no matter what power move you do or what spell, it always feels just a little bit lacking, aside from those stunning cutscenes. And that brings us to sound music and voice. For the Elk's Mane! Yeah! Great plan, I've got to 
smart. Just fire me down, boys. First, I want to talk about environmentally and atmospherically just for a second. This game is thick with various audio storytelling moments that I dig. It's got attacks and shouts and the crack of a massive spear being thrown towards your face. They all change and alter depending on where you are. You have fall off and redoubling when in tight locations. Those are instantly noticeable. Surround is well done with attacks from enemies and allies all directionally based and filtering in to help you imagine what it would be like with four friends taking on a legion of pissy fantasy creatures. However, this is a game about impact. Hit the ground the hammer rings out, the sound quakes, it sounds incredible. Hit an enemy and it's like, boink, 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 boink. There is no competition. This is the worst sound I have heard when it comes to a player hitting an enemy in years. It ruins the sound telling of hitting huge enemies with that handle of a sword because, you know, hitting them with a blade is just too goddamn good for them. But then when you do hit someone, it sounds like you're stubbing your foot on the world's most bored stool. There is a telling tone that rings out to inform the gamer of a hit, but that is pretty much it. And you probably would have already noticed that anyway. Instead, occasionally you'll miss the enemy and you'll hit the ground and you'll hear this thunderous, rousing explosion. You'll be like, that's what it's supposed to sound like. But guess what? It doesn't in the rest of the game. Now, while the explosions and the spells and all the other parts are fine, that lack of absolutely solid hit sounds craters the game when it comes to the feeling of impact. And this was reflected on multiple sound systems across multiple different people playing with me for this review. Utterly disappointing. And that brings us to music. So this isn't that bad, especially when a number of the enemies are based around sort of a tribal kind of thing when it comes to, especially the goblins. They have this quick attack drum with a super tight beat when you enter combat. It works really well to get your blood boiling. Surprisingly enough, mostly gone are those big orchestral moments. There are a couple tracks with some dudes who seem like they're really excited to get their moment in the sun and just go face on the violins. I really actually like that track though, especially because it sounded a little bit different. This is music that I can get behind. It's a bit more subdued than what people may want or expect from a fantasy game, I get that, but especially with the large number of places you explore, I found it to be reminiscent of older action titles and fantasy action titles anyway, so I was fine with that. What was something I wasn't fine with? The voice. Goblins killed my father. My birth father. Did you know that? First triggered our defenses and turned our halls into ruins. These halls were my home for five years. So don't doubt that I share your grief. Thanks for that, Wolfgar. Now, let's set things right. It's hard to imagine what your favorite character from a book is going to sound like until you hear him at first, but I assume a giant hero isn't going to sound like a 45-year-old businessman on the wrong end of an eight-hour telephone call and a trip home to a wife and kid he hated. All the characters, they're written incredibly bland, and I don't even understand how that's possible. They say stuff as you traipse through some of the locations, and they have occasional witty one-liners, but I found myself wondering if something was wrong with the audio mix in-game, because once again, the difference between the cutscenes and the in-game stuff is huge. These are the four biggest heroes in Forgotten Realms, or at least some of the biggest. And somehow, they seem like they have stage fright. It's like the old NWA wrestling show, and you invite the four horsemen on, and Ric Flair decides that he really has, well, nothing important to say. Enemies and their voices and characters are pretty much fine, but overall, there just isn't nearly as much going on as I assumed there would be, even at the starting of the game. Some of the mid-tier and prior-to boss end cutscenes were really good, but other than a couple standouts, honestly, not not that much, and no one seemed that excited to actually be there. Speaking of excited to be there, the gameplay is going to make you feel that way if it's good. Let's talk about gameplay and a bit about the story. You and your friends, either solo or up to three people with you, take on the guises of the heroes of the hall in their explorations and adventures around the Krishinabon, which may sound like an amazing four-person adventure for a delicious pastry, but it's not. Imagine the One Ring from Lord of the Rings, if it was a shard of crystal, and that's it. It's basically Lord of the Rings after that. Krishinabon is a crystal of malevolent power, and it turns those who want to use it into slaves. 
Graves. As a third-person D&D action role-playing game, you and your friends go out to try to stop the evil and explore various locations. You unlock items, you attack enemies, you find out more about what's going on in the story, and at the end of each battle, you return home to upgrade the items that you have found out and about. You raise various statistics, and then you head back out again. It's a super-evolved gauntlet, if you will, with each hero having a weapon of choice, Warhammer, Axe and shield, sword, or bow and arrow. While the weapons themselves don't differentiate the characters incredibly well, the particular skills of each does. Skills like Catabray's ability to entangle enemies and heal you, which is a lifesaver in the game, or the ability to pirouette death style an entire legion of enemies by spinning around and holding your hammer out like a homicidal pinball bumper. Some are ranged, some are tanky like the dwarf, others are better at just flicking in and out of combat like Drist. And the mid rangers, they're like the barbarian. They have a mix of the ability to throw your hammer as well as get in up close and personal and take people out. And when you return home, you open up a chest of items that you collected along the way, much of them requiring exploration and a pretty keen eye to find. And you can then equip them. Nothing is equipable in the field. It is a bit like Vermintide in that way. At the base, you can also improve attributes when you level up as well as get feats and abilities. Now, attributes themselves are just what you think. You got your strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and stamina. These are offering bonuses to their requisite it tied in percentages. As you can go up in levels, you occasionally get points to raise these, and they are highly important. So remember the attributes, because it's actually easy to sort of miss some of the upgrades that you can do. The real meat of the game, of course, is the combat mixed with that equipment juggle, and that's where Dark Alliance is at its best when it's running. There are eight spots for armor. You're consistently looking for the overall armor score, plus a large number of statistical adjustments, resistances, and even penetrative bonuses that the armor can give. Deciding if you want to wear something up upgrade it, sell it for money to upgrade something else, or just keep it for later in case you need more of its resistance type is easily the best part of the game. This also means that even a slight adjustment to a couple armor pieces and a weapon can have massive differences in how you go through a level. But I've already seen this question come up, so I want to tell you, this will not be changing your different attack animations or anything there. This is not Monster Hunter. You have the same weapon throughout the entire game. You just have different skins for it, of course, and upgrades. Basically, the overall attacks are the same. Now, you have sets of two, five, and eight items items in your armor and equipment. In the same overall set, they also offer bonuses like more health being dropped by enemies, a larger chance of more health, and then a massive bonus if you have eight pieces of the same armor set. And all armor has its own statistics as well as bonuses that are randomly rolled as well. Now, all items are improved by using crystals to upgrade them, each color connected to the rarity of the item. You can upgrade low-level crystals to higher ones at a trade-off of losing some of them in that conversion as well as downgrading one. It's also very strategic and because each level has so many traps and environmental hazards, it can be a difference between a fairly easy run and one that is nut crushing. You have challenge ratings you can assign prior to the level loading, and I can tell you those upper levels are no friggin' joke, especially if you are not prepped for resistances. Unfortunately, one thing I did notice is there was no real way to tell what I was going to need when I went into that level. That mystery is there, and that's very cool, but at the same time, <laughs> watching these heroes freeze to death and die is pretty cool. It's just one of those things that when you have a fiction, you have to sort of buy off on that this is going to be gamified. When fighting, you have the ability to dodge and parry, assign items to quick slots for healing, weak attack and strong attack, as well as jumping. All these combined result in moves that can be strung together. You have special moves that you can buy with gold back at the base camp between levels as well. Now, if Dark Alliance does anything well, it's that it does show how power impacts your overall skills. While you have a couple basic combos at the starting, you will be dropping hammers into the ground, calling Shadow Fiends, somersaulting away from explosive arrows and then winding up for huge 20, 30, 40 hit combos and depending on weapons inflicting all sorts of status ailments later on. Sadly, if any of that sounded good, prepare to be disappointed because the game utterly falls apart in combat. The first part is that in Dark Alliance, you can either free attack or lock onto enemies, but for reasons I can't possibly fathom, in free attack, you can't adjust your direction. I mean, you can't even line up a combo on another enemy. You have to shortchange it, let it complete, or you can try dodge breaking out of it to reset your ability to even aim. It's nasty looking. It feels ancient. And in fact, at times, especially with more players and all the changes to the enemy status on the game screen, it felt completely unfun. Worse yet, though, is the lock-on. The game's collision detection is robust for players and enemies, with enemies actually getting hit by their own teammates' moves and specials, which is incredible. I love that. Please, every game, you need to do that. However, in this game, the moment you lock on, it's like District 9 shaky cam. It's like someone did all the coke and said, hey, guys, pose for me for a second for some selfies. It's terrible, and it's connected to the actual FOV of the game, meaning that at its extremes on both ends, 
That means it either zooms into an almost atom level on the enemies or it doesn't zoom in at all. And the sensitivity turned up on high still results in glacier movement, regardless of what you try to do. That idea of having the FOV tied to that is a terrible idea. It doesn't work at all. It makes everything feel nasty. The game also has a huge problem with lag if you are connected. I connected with a player two miles from me with a sub 50 ping as well as a continent away from me with a hundred plus ping. Regardless, items would take a quarter second to break under a hammer swing. Enemies wouldn't show their animations until well after they got hit and sometimes the buffer for movements would build up to the point that it resulted in me doing combos where the enemy wasn't even in the same location anymore. This this can all make things like dodging and parrying, the second of which is a huge part of the game, wickedly difficult to pull off unless you're in single player mode. This is all the more surprising because the game isn't a service game at all and can be played alone with no internet connection. And if you're thinking to yourself, hey man, I'll just use keyboard. No, you won't. Mouse acceleration is on all the time. I can't even fathom how it got turned on in the first place. It's terrible. It should never be on in games. It makes anyone who would want to play this with mouse and keyboard at a noticeable penalty, if not just a little bit sick. Mouse acceleration is about as good of an idea as an almost driving self car just basically pushing and pulling you around as you try to figure out where it actually wants to go i just don't even understand how it's in a game at this point anymore especially with the inability to turn it on just get it out of there quit watching tiktok for your hacks you're gonna get somebody killed and there's a much higher chance of that getting you killed than the enemy because the ai is also broken i love the various ways enemies would come at you and the groups you can have some really oddly divergent enemy groups with long range and short range you have huge brutes all thundering around around level trying to get at you. And when that all happens, it's great. But that's if they attack at all. Because if you're above an enemy as the tactic that the game actually relishes in by having two to three ways to get to most enemy locations anyway, if you arrive above them and start shooting, many times the enemy does nothing. I don't mean they look around for you. I don't mean they notice you. I mean, they don't do anything at all. They just die. And no, I'm not done. Also, enemies seem tied into very small locations, which will have them standing still like five feet in front of you. But there's some kind of magical rock, which, by the way, looks like a normal rock to everybody else, but is apparently totally magical and scary. And it stops them from actually getting to you. Fixes like these can be done in patches, but there are a massive number of problems with this game. The control issue needs to be fixed right away. Remove the goddamn awful camera zoom. Make sure it isn't connected to the actual FOV of the game, which is just broken. The mouse acceleration, all of these things, the AI in particular, they need to be fixed. This is a game that it tries so hard that it creaks. It aims for that natural 20, but it just hits a series of friggin' brutal debuffs left and right. It's a title that every single time I went back to base and I upgraded and I got those sweet loots. I'm not exaggerating. Those parts were awesome. The game has this amazing feel when you're doing that. And then you have to go back out again. And speaking of not going out, which isn't probably that fun, let's talk about fun factor. Every single time I tried to enjoy myself with this game, it stymied me. I like the loot system. I love how it worked and the idea of going out there with the different sets. But since the weapons can't be changed and you just have your abilities and the skills, which admittedly aren't that amazing to begin with, you're left with these interactions and combat that is supposed to sell you on everything else, but it never does. Just when you make that suit of armor that is almost impervious to fire and you run into the enemies and pull them into a furnace and you're just hammering on them as the world burns, then the camera for no reason whatsoever will just spin wildly out of control. No matter how many times I tried to enjoy it, and just when I started to say, oh my God, this is actually getting fun, or went back and got a new piece of equipment, something terrible occurred, or one more thing I had to jump through to get it to be enjoyable popped up. And that, to me, is really unacceptable, especially in this day and age. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent, or never touch it again rating system, with rent being replaced by deep, deep sale on PC titles. This is a Game Pass game, so if you already have Game Pass, feel free to get this, because hey, it's free. But for me, this is a deep, deep sale. And I mean, deep, 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 deep. You need to wait a while. This thing needs patches. It needs attention to care. It needs serious fixes on some of the levels, bug fixes on enemy movement, some AI fixes. The issue here is that some of the levels, nothing really bad occurs. And that's when you're playing it going, this is actually awesome. But this thing needs to sit. It needs to bake more. And right now, it is not ready, even at that lower price point of $40 that it's being offered right now. I am sorry, but there are enough issues here that people need to really look at this title with a great deal of caution when it comes to their buying dollar. So anyway, that's it for me. I hope you guys liked the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Subscribe, damn it. 
subscribe. I would love for you to subscribe. Anyway, that's it for me. You're going to be seeing more videos from me in the coming weeks. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.